Hello and welcome everyone. I would like to thank all of you for joining us here today and again welcome you to our uh, online presentation, our hot topics in creative nonfiction. And our webinar today is entitled Behind the Editor's Desk, What Editors Publish and Why. And we have a unique format today to give you some um, insights into this uh, presentation. Uh, it will be an interview format with with our uh, program director of our MFA in creative nonfiction, Leanna James Blackwell, interviewing one of our MFA faculty members, Sari Botten. So we're very pleased to have you joining us here today. And before we get started, I just want to um, mention that there is a questions box, which you should see on your screen, uh, where you can type your questions in, hit send, and we will read all of these and respond to you. So we're gonna take questions at the end of this presentation, but you can feel free to go ahead and type them in as we go. Um, and then we will, I will be reading all the questions aloud um, once um, we've finished with the official presentation. So um, before we get started and I turn it over, I just wanted to um, give you a brief um, overview of Bay Path University for any of you who um, are not familiar with um, Bay Path. We were established in 1897, um, and we have a very long history of providing educational opportunities um, for both women and men um, in the Pioneer Valley, where we are located in Longmeadow, Massachusetts. We're fully accredited by the New England Commission of Higher Education, which is the uh, regional accrediting body that all the uh, colleges, public and private, in the New England region carry. And we offer on our um, campus traditional four-year undergraduate degrees for women, um, degree completion degrees um, in the, at the bachelor's level for um, adult women um, online. And we offer over 30 graduate programs and certificates for both women and men. Many of these are available in the evenings on campus and online. Um, and our MFA in creative nonfiction writing uh, is a 39 credit fully online program with no residency requirement. And we'll be talking very briefly about our MFA program at the end of this presentation. So with that, I would like to turn our um, webinar over today to uh, Leanna James Blackwell, our program director. Thank you, Jen. Um, and welcome, everybody. We're so glad you can be here today. I'm going to introduce Sari to all of you, and I'm so pleased to welcome her. Sari is a writer, editor, and teacher living in Kingston, New York. She's the essays editor for Long Reads, editor of the award-winning anthology, Goodbye to All That, Writers on Loving and Leaving New York, and it's New York Times best-selling follow-up, Never Can Say Goodbye, Writers are on their unshakable love for New York. If you haven't read either of those, I highly recommend them both. She's the operator of Kingston Writer Studio and she's a member as of this year on the MFA faculty. I've admired Siri's work for years, her eye and sensibility, her taste and judgment. And when I saw that she was teaching a course at Catapult on creating and selling literary anthologies, I was in. I'd had an idea for an anthology for a long time. I was really looking forward to what Sari had to say. And I learned in that class that not only is she a very skilled editor and writer, which I already knew, but an excellent teacher. So when an opportunity arose to teach in the MFA, I immediately thought of her. I was delighted when she agreed to come on as faculty and I'm delighted she's with us today. Welcome, Sari. Thank you, Leanna. It's so great to be here. So let's jump in. We have a lot to cover, and I know we don't want to wait any longer to hear from you. Um, Sari, I know you've talked about this before in your interview for the MFA blog, and you've also written about it in your subscription e-newsletter, Adventures in Journalism, which I subscribe to and I look forward to reading whenever a new one appears. For those who aren't MFA students on this webinar and who may not be familiar with your story, can you tell us a little bit about your career journey? I know it's a long story, but <laughs> it's so interesting. Maybe a few key points. 
Well, I've had a, a really weird career path because I had a few different aspirations. Um, I had creative writing goals and I also had journalism goals. Um, and I didn't know I had journalism goals until I was a junior in college and my father and my boyfriend at the time both pestered me that I should apply for the Newsday internship, um, which I got and they put me on the arts desk. Prior to that, I had wanted to be a playwright um, and that led me to arts journalism. And I started pursuing that, but then somewhere along the way, I realized that I really wanted to also pursue creative writing. Um, and, you know, while I was working at newspapers and magazines, I was always on the side trying to either pursue an MFA. I'm a two-time dropout, Sarah Lawrence in City <laughs> College, um, and also just publish. Um, and, you know, I, I published Two Modern Loves. Um, that's, that was a way for me to, you know, in a journalistic publication, publish something um, creative. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's creative nonfiction, which is what I'm teaching at Baypath. Um, and then a few years later, um, after my first Modern Love, I had an opportunity to start writing for The Rumpus, which is a literary magazine online, mm -hmm. um, therumpus.net. And um, I started a column there called Conversations with Writers Braver Than Me, where I would interview memoirists. Um, and it kind of put me in the literary world in a way that I hadn't been. Um, it was the beginning of my um, sort of building up my literary citizenship. And it, um, it gave me opportunities to write for other places. Um, and it's just something I've been building ever since. And, you know, meeting other writers, collaborating with other writers, including them in anthologies. Uh, my anthologies then led me to long reads. Um, my editors mm -hmm. liked my books. Um, I had also written for Mike Dang, the editor in chief, when he was editing The Billfold. Um, and then, um, Long Reads, uh, where I'm the essays editor, has allowed me to expand further into this. I, I write sometimes at Long Reads. I've published some, some of my own essays, but I also publish two to three essays, long form essays a week on the site. So um, I started my newsletter, Adventures in Journalism, and there are scare quotes around, scare quotes around the word journalism because it's been a lot of non-journalistic work over the years. Um, <laughs> I started it in April. It's on Substack um, because it was just, people ask me all the time about my trajectory. And I feel like I'm only first in my 50s really landing where I have meant to be. It's taken, I've taken a lot of circuitous turns. Sometimes I've been impatient. Sometimes I've been too patient. Um, Sometimes I've just grabbed at the wrong thing. But um, anyway, I'm finally feeling good about my career. <laughs> I think a lot of writers feel exactly the same way. I know very few who had a direct chronological linear progression into what they're doing now. And I think maybe it's really meant to be that way. I think it makes us more interesting people, more interesting writers. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about Long Reads. For those who don't know, it's a reader-supported online magazine that, as the tagline says, is dedicated to the best storytelling in the world. Long Reads is unusual among literary sites in that, true to its name, it features pieces over 3,000 words, up to 10,000 in some cases, which is one of the reasons that I'm such a dedicated reader and supporter. I like the short form. I write in it but sometimes I want to settle in with a good, long, chewy read, and that's where I go to find them. And it's also unusual in that it runs both previously published and original work, investigative reporting, personal essays, interviews, and profiles that editors feel should be more widely shared, which is another thing I love about it because it's really creating a bigger sense of literary community. So tell us, Sari, how long have you been editing there now? Um, I am coming up on five years. In January, it'll be five years. Okay. Um, it started off as a much smaller role. Um, I was more of a blogger at the time. The site um, was 
less about originals at the time and more about aggregating um, pieces from around the web, long form pieces from around the web and blogging about them. Um, and now we have grown to be primarily um, originals, mm. meaning that we, we publish original pieces um, that we collaborate with writers on. As a personal essay and memoir editor, you don't receive pitches like the editors who work with critical or investigative pieces, but instead you get completed essays, which is how most literary magazines work. I'm curious, how many submissions do you receive each week? Oh my God, 50 to 100. Every it's week. Every week. And that's only, that's how many go to the essays at longreads.com email. Um, there are people emailing me submissions everywhere I have an email address <laughs> and also my social media DMs, which is not advised. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good to know, an important reminder. Yeah. Um, I know you ask for a detailed synopsis in the submission email, as well as a statement from writers about who they are and about their connection to the piece they're submitting. So based on the synopses and the statements, which I imagine you read carefully first, how many typically do you end up choosing to read and why? Well, at this point, I have a couple of other editors helping me read through the box, that inbox, uh, essays at longreads.com, because it is really an overwhelming um, volume of submissions. And I would never get anything else done if all I did was read that, uh, that mm -hmm. inbox. Um, mm -hmm. but I mean, how many do I, you know, I wind up probably reading, um, I don't know, 15 actual essays a week. Mm -hmm. Um, and I publish two to three a week. Um, so I am, I mean, it, it's like a minuscule percentage of the number that come in. I'm literally publishing between 100 and 150 a year, probably like 125 a year, and I'm receiving that many within two weeks. Um, so mm. it's crazy. It's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a long shot. And I have an autoresponder that suggests to writers that they do multiple simultaneous submissions so that I am not the only person considering your piece and I'm not keeping anybody from being published elsewhere. And I'm always very happy when people write back and say, I'm going to withdraw this because it was picked up somewhere else. Even if it's an amazing piece that I wish I had, because I just, you know, I'm a writer too, and I submit places and I don't think it's fair to like park on someone's piece for six months a year or you know which a lot of places will do um some places will many places will not let you do simultaneous multiple submissions and that makes no sense to me i i agree with you completely um for the same reason um for my students and for me submitting it just it doesn't make sense. And I know a lot of writers who do it anyway <laughs> yeah. and submit. And I can't actually hold, blame them for doing that. But I think it, it shows a kindness and awareness on your part that you make it explicitly clear that you welcome that and support that and that you're not hanging on to their piece forever and then getting to know at the end. Um, so I'm curious. So you've got these 15 essays and you've chosen these what made you choose these particular ones i know it changes all the time so some of them might be just because you loved them and you really can't explain why but i'm wondering if there are certain things that always work and if there are other things that typically disqualify an essay in your mind well um there are a number of factors you know one being um, where does the piece fit into the mix of mm -hmm. pieces that you've already done? And I'll give you an example. Um, last week I published a particular essay and then I immediately received a few on the same topic. People who had seen that essay and thought, oh, she's open to essays on this topic. When logically 
it will be a long time before I come to that subject again. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. that's like counterintuitive. If I just published on a subject, don't send me a piece on that same subject because I don't need another one on that subject for quite a while. Um, so one of the factors is, you know, where does it fit in the mix? Do I have so many pieces on this subject um, in this category or is there room for another one? Um, also voices, uh, a combination of, first of all, I wanna make sure that I am um, being inclusive and diverse in who I'm choosing pieces from and the subjects. Mm -hmm. um, and also like who has a good command of their voice in their piece. Um, it's so competitive that you really have to be, um, your piece has to be really polished and your voice has to be really clear um, and you have to have command over your story and your voice. Um, mm -hmm. And then another thing is, you know, how people are to me in their emails. Um, you know, I often get emails, submissions from people who are not respectful and kind. Um, it's not, maybe it's not that shocking, but there are people out there who are just, coming at this with a huge sense of entitlement and it doesn't bode well for what it's going to be like to work with those people. And I am able these days, I think, to weed that out uh, more quickly. I, you know, I hear this all the time and I see a lot of discussions about it on social media and I'm always amazed thinking, how does anyone imagine that's going to help? Um, not being respectful to an editor. Uh, There's a piece this week on the New York Magazine site by an editor at McSweeney's um, where he actually displays many of the follow-up emails he gets from people after he passes on their work very kindly and thoughtfully. Um, they send the most obnoxious emails and it's a really, um, this piece really resonated for me because um, mm. One of the things that I explain in my autoresponder is that I'm only going to get in touch with you if I want your piece. I don't um, like assume unless you hear from me that the piece is not accepted. I mean, the numbers, you know, if I'm receiving 50 to 100 submissions a week and I publish 125 a year, most likely I am not going to pick your piece. And the number one reason is because I have too many submissions. Um, and there are some people who are so they have no idea what it's like to have my job and to receive all these submissions and to have to make sense of the inbox. And some of the um, responses to that are really rude. Oh, gosh, I can imagine. <laughs> I, I would like not to, but I can imagine. And yet I'm sure that on your end, when you're submitting pieces, you now you understand what the person on the other side is going through. So if you don't get a response, for instance, you don't, you move on to the next one. Exactly. Um, one after that. You know, a thing I've that always wondered about is the patterns, literary patterns, because you see things come in and out of style. Um, you suddenly see a great deal of interest about one topic and then it fades. And I'm wondering if you see a pattern in the kinds of essays you receive. And if so, what are they? And have they changed at all over time? Um, well, I don't know about that. I mean, I think I'm, I'm getting a lot of different voices. Um, mm. One thing that comes up a lot, there are waves of this, the, um, the second person essay. Um, I will only publish one or two a year and they have mm -hmm. to be really good but they all sound the same. Um, the second person voice, you know, it went through a, a phase, there was a trend in the late 80s and early 90s, and it was um, dominated by Laurie Moore, Jay McInerney, um, Pam Houston. They were all writing these second person pieces and they were new and fresh then, and mm -hmm. then they were overdone, and then now, um, I, I mean, I, I must get at least one a week and, um, they, they 
they all sound the same. They all sound like they are um, impersonating Lori Moore. Um, and <laughs> I, like even the best ones, there's just something about that voice that it's really hard to differentiate. And so I, I publish literally one or two a year. And then of course, as soon as I publish it, everybody sends me their second person. Oh, they take second person. Um, I recently, hmm. Mm -hmm. I recently um, said to a writer, I would be interested in this piece if you would put it in the first person. And she did, and it works. Oh, yeah. That, that is really a good thing, I think, for everyone to hear that it can work. Getting feedback from an editor means generally the editor's interested, wants to work with you, and it might be worth trying it. Sometimes it isn't, you know, sometimes um, it in some way will threaten the integrity of the piece but this sounds like different story like yeah yeah um i mean and if a, if an editor takes the time to make a suggestion you know it's it means something it means your piece is worth you know is good and that you should maybe consider it of course if if she didn't want to and she wanted to take it elsewhere that would have been fine um mm -hmm. another thing i've been um working on a lot lately is um there are there are some white writers who have blind spots um, and don't know that they are um, writing pieces that have problematic elements. And I there's a piece I'm going to publish um, where the author there was only one character in the story who is described visually as brown and whose uh, last name reveals an ethnicity. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I was going to not take the piece, but then I, I said to the writer, would you be willing to take out the, you know, there's no one else in the piece that we know what they look like, what their last name is. Would you be willing to um, change that? Because, and, and, and this particular character is the perpetrator of a crime. Um, and I, I said, you know, we have, an overwhelming number of stories in our culture um, in which a person of color is the perpetrator of a crime. And, you know, that doesn't mean that this person didn't commit a crime, but it means what are we choosing to publish? So, and she was, I figured that she was not going to be willing to make the change, but she is. Um, so uh, I appreciate when writers are open to suggestions like that. That's a wonderful example, too, of not just a suggestion to make the writing better, but to help the writer's awareness. Yes. Um, I'll bet that she doesn't make that mistake again. And that's a wonderful thing. And that's how we learn from editors. I appreciate every piece of editing advice um, that I ever have received from at least editors who have stayed with me to the end and published my pieces and have done a wonderful job um, being open to it has made all the difference. I've learned a lot. I'm wondering um, about the, the topics you get, and I imagine they range all over the place. I, a two-sided question, are there some topics that you think are done to death? And are there any stories that you think don't get written about enough? Um, and I just wanna say a few words about the series that you started. Like, I know you created and edit a series for long reads called Fine Lines about age. And, and when I first saw the announcement of that, I remember being so excited and thinking, there isn't enough about this. I can't wait to see what kind of essays. And they've been incredible. I mean, I'm thinking there are the recent ones you've published, like Carolita Johnson's illustrated essay about her older husband's death. And uh, Catherine Texier's piece, which I think was a week or two ago, about the way aging women are pushed into limiting roles and about the way she pushes right back. Are these among the stories you think readers need to see more of? Is that why you created it? And are there others? Well, um, that's a multi-pronged question. <laughs> yes, I'm aware. Um, so take your time. Well, I'll tell you, there is an overwhelming number of essays coming my way about death, grief, um, a lot about um, mm -hmm. uh, difficult pregnancy and childbirth, 
infertility, those are the ones I get again and again and again, and they're important, and I run those, but there are way more of those than um, than others, um, and so there's more to weed through. Um, mm. What I don't get enough of are lighter treatments, um, even of dark subjects. Uh, for example, we had a piece by mm -hmm. Ken Otterberg a few years ago um, called Grief is a Jumble Word. And it is about um, his grieving uh, after the passing of his wife from cancer, but it's actually funny. He takes the absurdity of grief and death and dying, and he just... Um, runs with it, like how absurd it is that he has to get up in the morning and sit at the same table where his wife used to sit with him and, you know, just go through his rituals. And it's, it's darkly funny. And I, I want more pieces that even if the subject is dark or painful or, um, you know, otherwise difficult, that there's somebody, um, kind of pointing out the absurdity of it. Um, mm. There's another one. Um, we had a piece called um, Why I Lied to Everyone in High School About Knowing Karate um, <laughs> by Jabeen Akhtar. And it's really a piece about um, being an immigrant child, uh, trying to fit in, you know, trying to be, um, you know, like a uh, magical immigrant. Um, and it's about her relationship with her dad, but it's funny. It is so funny, but it's also tender. So I don't get enough of those. Um, now regarding fine lines, I started that because, um, I have always felt, um, mystified by age and aging. And this is something I'm 54 years old. This is not a new phenomenon for me. This has been going on for me since I was 10. At my 10th birthday party, my uncle said to me very soberly, you'll never be one digit again. And I burst into <sighs> tears. Like I hadn't even known that that was a thing. And like, um, you know, and I started grieving my single digit years at 10 and then started wondering like how am I supposed to act how am I supposed to be um I've never felt in step with my age group I also I don't have children um I've had a lot of periods in my life where I was very freelance and didn't have like a typical job situation so I've always felt out of step with my peers and wondered like how am I supposed to feel? How am I supposed to act? Um, and so I wanted to get people's perspectives on this. And I also wanted to write about it. I have a piece in the series called Losing the Plot that is about um, my simultaneous um, obsession with planning for death and my avoidance around planning for death. Um, mm -hmm. I remember that one. Yeah. Um, so that series is very dear to me and it's very popular and we just had yes you mentioned um Catherine Texier's piece which has been hugely popular we also had Laura Lippman um has written three pieces in that series she's a wonderful crime novelist and she's got three pieces but it's not just women and it's not just older people I've got Matthew Salis's in that series um writing about you know, he's in his 30s and he's writing about the experience of time and aging at, in the wake of his wife's death mm -hmm. uh, a, a year ago, a little over a year ago. And um, it's a really remarkable piece. Um, there's also a piece by Therese um, Mayhot, um, and she's yes. also in her 30s. So it's not it's not AARP for long reads. It's really just about what's what is it what is it like to pass through time in a human body um, of any age or gender. You know, it's extraordinarily difficult to explore that piece with, I mean, to explore that topic with the honesty that I see the writers in long reads do, and 
um, to be willing to go into those dark places and sometimes with a great deal of humor. Um, I liked that about Catherine Texier's piece. Um, it made me laugh many times um, and it was serious at the same time. You know, when you were talking a little earlier about the kind of lighter treatment in very dark places, I was thinking of Ross Chast, who does that extraordinarily. Yes. I, I yes. I don't know if you read her memoir. Um, can we please talk about something more pleasant? About, I have read that. It's one of my favorites, and I push it onto people. Um, I mean, that couldn't get any more painful than what she talks about. But it has that too, that absurdity. Um, and Carolita Johnson does that too. And she's also a New yes. Yorker cartoonist. Um, her series on our site is called um, A Woman's Work. And she's done five of the six so far. The sixth one will come out in December. Um, and she's so good at um, really taking something very tender, uh, grief, um, loss, sexism, and really... Um, pointing to the absurdity of it and and illustrating it in a way that you walk away feeling touched and moved and also you laugh. To be able to do all of those in one piece is, is remarkable. And I remember after reading, I guess it was the third or fourth piece of hers that I'd written, that I'd read, wondering if she was going to put those together in in a book or if, if that's coming out so i sure uh, hope somebody picks that up i feel like it would be um you know it could sit on the shelf next to mira jacobs good talk you mm -hmm. know um, which is illustrated um i feel like they would be great you know on the same shelf <laughs> so of of the hundreds and hundreds of essays you've edited I'd love to know which ones would you say have had the most impact on readers? I know you mentioned Catherine Trexier's one was very popular. Over the five years, are there any that really stand out to you as having had a kind of longevity in which people read and still talked about um, that really seemed to make a difference? Um, Matthew Salas's piece um, mm -hmm. is constantly getting retweeted. Uh, the one it's called, um, let, me, let me get the exact name of it. Mm -hmm. um, hang on one second. Sure. Um, it's called, um, To Grieve is to Carry Another Time. Um, that piece, which I guess came out earlier this year, um, has been just, uh, it just gets shared and shared and shared um, again and again. Um, what are some others? Um, uh, some of the ones by Alexander Chi. Mm -hmm. um, he's mm -hmm. written a few for us. Um, they get shared again and again. He has one called The Changeling. Um, about um, when he realized he was a writer um, and um, oh there have been so many it's it's hard to um, I'm sure it is yeah it's hard to say um, which are the ones that have had the most impact um, well and sometimes it's invisible you know I'm sure there are times when it has tremendous impact on readers and you just don't necessarily know um, yeah but I know I read as much of it as I can every week. I subscribe to the email roundup mm -hmm. and, and that is part of my literary nourishment every week. Uh, gives me new ideas, introduces me to writers or re reacquaints me with writers I love. Um, so on to my next question for you, which is beyond long reads. And I want to know, and I'm sure our listeners do too, about your editing process, how you might describe your style and how it might differ from other editors you know or have worked with. Um, I'm a very collaborative editor. I work with people in Google Docs. Um, I, um, mm. I'm also, I like to have a light hand. I like to make sure that I'm not changing a writer's voice. I'm not, um, mm -hmm. you know, 
messing with how they like to sound. Um, no, I work with a range of writers in terms of experience and uh, level of um, command over their work. And so sometimes I do a deeper edit um, you know, depending on who the writer is and what the piece is, you know, sometimes I'm trying to give um, newer writers a chance to um, establish themselves. And so in those cases, I tend to do more to the piece. But even still, I generally like to edit with a light hand um, and only change what really is necessary. This comes from having been edited. Um, I'm a writer myself, and I've had a lot of I've had mixed experiences as a writer being edited and especially, you know, like in the 80s and 90s at women's magazines, I think where women felt like they had to justify their jobs a lot. Um, they sometimes people were just making changes that were not necessary for the sake of like proving that they need to exist. And I have, I have, you know, um, I model myself against that. <laughs> I, I'm trying really hard to be supportive of writers' voices, keep a light hand. I also am collaborative in um, creating the heads and decks of um, that go, or that headlines and subheadlines that go on people's pieces because I've had so many clunkers put on my pieces over the years. Um, and I really feel like writers should have a say in the titling of their piece. I've had almost every title of mine changed <laughs> and it could that could say something about my my talent for titling my own work. I, I now share it with writer friends of mine and say help me find a title because I know it's going to happen. Um, I've mostly had positive experiences with a couple of exceptions and one I remember very well which the editor herself had a very particular aesthetic, and she really admired short, sharp, declarative sentences, which was fine, but she made the entire piece that way. And what ended up happening is that the information was there, but the sound was so different that it was, it no longer resembled anything I would write. And so I, I yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I felt that way too. It was not collaborative. Uh, but it had to go out. So it went out and there was my name on it. And I thought, okay. And, you know, that happens to writers, but I'm sure um, writers appreciate that light touch and that collaborative spirit you bring. Thanks. Now, we have just a few minutes before I wanted to open it up to questions because I know we're going to have plenty, or I suspect we will. Um, if you could give any advice to writers that we haven't touched on yet, We've touched on a lot about pitching or submitting. You know, what would you say are the most important things to do or to think about before they press that send button? Well, the first thing is to be patient um, with your own process. I know in my own career, I have published so many half-baked essays that I'm so glad you can no longer find online. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know there's it's so competitive and people are so anxious that they're never going to get their chance that they just send pieces that are not ready um and so like mm -hmm. really make sure first of all that you have enough critical distance from whatever it is that you're writing about so that you are, as they say at the moth, writing from your scars and not your wounds. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Make sure um, that you've taken some time away from it and then gone back to it to make sure you still feel good about everything that's in there. Because sometimes when we're writing in the heat of the moment, oh, this is so good, this is so good, I can't wait to send it. And then you send it and then you look at it a month later and you're like, oh my God, I, I can't believe I didn't think this through more. So like mm -hmm. <laughs> really wait, wait until you know it's really where you want it. Um, and then uh, submit far and wide. Uh, and you know what? Even the publications that tell you do not do multiple submissions, 
I'm sorry, screw them. <laughs> Do it. And, and if you find that you get accepted by that place and another place, that's a happy problem. It's so rare that it happens. Um, you know, just, uh, you know, just if you get it accepted somewhere else, then let the other people know that it's, you know, withdraw it and let them know it's going somewhere else. Submit far and wide. Um, be willing to submit, uh, you know, in the beginning to places that maybe don't pay. Um, because when you're getting your first clips together, you, um, you know, that that's part of the process. Um, I know everybody should be paid for their writing, but there are websites that exist that don't have funding, but they are very well respected and a clip there will help you then get accepted at a place that does pay. Um, well, be a good literary citizen. Cheer on your friends when they uh, succeed. Um, and, you know, so that then when it's your turn, they'll be there for you. And, um, you know, it, it really is a community, the literary community. And be on Twitter. Um, find a community on Twitter, the literary community. Um, look for submission opportunities there. Um, how's that? Mm -hmm. I think that's wonderful. And I, I really like what you say about literary citizenship. I think that is important and it actually can benefit writers maybe more than they realize in terms of it doesn't take away from you to cheer other writers on. It, it's the opposite. Um, when I read a piece that I love, I always make sure I retweet it. I say some things about it. I, I send a message to the writer. We need that. And and it helps me feel connected to my fellow writers. We're all in this together. So I, I like that. And the patience part, I think that's a really, that's an excellent point. And I've done exactly what you said. And I've had the exact same feeling a month later. So um, before we have one second left, and then we're gonna go to questions. Um, anything that you wish writers would know during the editing process that you wish they would know or do or not do when you're working with them. You touched mm. on it a little bit, so I'm sure we're not much more to say. Well, sometimes I get writers who are so nervous that I'm going to be overbearing in the editing process because they've had those experiences before that mm -hmm. they can be a little bit rude to me. Um, and they can also, um, like I recently worked with someone who every single edit I suggested in Google Docs um, in the suggesting mode pushed back on every single one and I had to explain every single one again and again and you know I finally said listen I'm editing with a light hand here I'm not even this is not an overbearing edit and I'm doing this so that you will have the best experience of people reading your piece and appreciating it um, so I think that a lot of people are anxious about being edited and can be a little bit knee jerk jerky about it. And there's no need to do that, especially not with me, because I am trying to give you a good experience and I'm not going to go crazy on your piece. I'm going to only do editing suggestions that I feel are necessary. And I also invite you to push back on the ones that you don't like. So, but not every single one. Not every, every single one, yeah. exactly. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. This is incredibly informative and enlightening and, and just fun to talk with you. And now I want to open it up to give our listeners a chance to ask their questions. If you have one, please type it in the chat box if, if you already haven't. And you can continue to think about it while we wait and anything comes to you, type it in and Jen will let us know what they are and Sari will do her best to address them. Thanks, Liana and Sari. Um, this is Jen and I see a couple things coming in. So I think it's best if I just read the transcript of what the person has written and uh, both of you or either of you can take it from there. Thank um, you. Question, what appeals to you more, the straightforward chronological piece that tells the story or the multi-layered piece that connects different topics and ideas to the main story? Good question, Sari. <laughs> I'm going to say both. 
um, those are two variations, um, both of which work. I think more often than not, not though, um, chronological order works best. Um, and this is something I was recently discussing with our um, audience editor um, in terms of a series where the author wanted to start with the last piece and go backwards. Um, Hmm. That somehow there's something about online uh, reading that makes chronological um, storytelling work better. I mean, I just generally think chronological story works better, but I like the other kind as well um, when it's well done. Um, I'll also say there are times when it's appropriate to start with the ending um, and then have the piece be you know, having, have the suspense in the rest of the piece be about how did it happen and why did it happen? Um, I edited a piece by someone whose entire family died in the space of two months around 9-11. Um, and the piece was building toward that, but it was such a devastating bit of information that I felt, let's get this out of the way right up front. Let's just put this up front and then the rest of the story leads you to the how and why. So um, mm. there are cases for, um, you know, uh, varying the order. Um, I will also say though, that the pieces where um, it's not in chronological order and it goes back and forth in time, sometimes it takes a lot of work to make sure that it's clear to the reader where we are at any point any given point in the piece. And so that takes a lot of um, a lot of work. And we have to remember that Long Reads is online and um, we are competing with everything else that's you know flashing on your screen. Um, so it, it might be different if you're sitting with a literary journal uh, in your lap and you have a different expectation and a different uh, you know, way you're spending your time. If you're on your computer, like we really need to, you can't beat around the bush for a long time. The reader really needs to know what kind of a story they're investing in. They're investing their time in within like the first few paragraphs. Mm, great. Thank you, Sari. Jen, any other questions? We do. We have several. So just uh, to keep that in mind as as we go through with the responses, um, okay. the next one. <laughs> the next <laughs> one is, how would you compare the intentions of your interactions with students you teach to your interactions with writers you edit? The intentions. Um, I mean, most of the students I work with probably want to also get published on long reads, <laughs> um, and I have published a number of students um, from my catapult workshops. Um, in fact, tomorrow I'm going to publish and also on Monday. Um, mm. So I think, uh, but at Bay Path though, right now I'm in a, uh, a low level mentorship lab and people are just um, kind of working out their chops right now. So their intention is different. They're working on, um, really developing their chops, uh, you know, for generally writing creative nonfiction. So their intention is a little bit different, but I'm sure that in the end, they'd like to publish. Great, and the person kind of submitted a, a clarification question um, regarding the um, intentions of the students, um, either the, uh, that you teach or uh, who you work, who, or writers who edit, how are these relationships similar and how are they different is the follow-up. Um, uh, uh, well, I mean, with, with writers I work with, I'm, I'm working with them for two weeks. Uh, and then um, occasionally I, I uh, publish pieces by the same person more than once. Um, but it might be a little bit closer with students because we'll work together in a workshop and then they might submit to me or maybe they get in touch and ask for advice. Um, so I think sometimes the relationship with students is closer. I don't know. Well, it's okay, longer term too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go on, Excellent. Jen. All right. Um, sometimes it seems creative nonfiction students are wonderfully creative, but their grammar is less wonderful. 
how much should people worry about that if someone needs a less light touch with editing? Um, you got to polish your piece. Um, I'm, I'm not going to take a piece that isn't um, up to a certain standard of grammar, spelling. Um, you know, there can be errors. There's errors in every piece. Even the most um, accomplished writers have errors in their pieces. But you need to proofread your piece. You should probably have your writer's group go through it um, or a friend. Um, you know, this is the big time. This is professional. And um, yeah, you need, to, you need to polish your writing. Okay. What is your advice about writing character dialogue and how do you judge it? Um, I'll often ask writers to create a scene rather than just give exposition um, when there are characters involved and action um, and dialogue. Uh, you know, instead of just saying, my father said to me, my father told me not to do this, I'll say, can you give me a scene here with dialogue? Um, I, even though it's creative nonfiction and it's, you know, you weren't there with a tape recorder in your childhood recording the exact dialogue. Um, I think it really brings pieces to life. Um, and I think the readers of creative nonfiction understand that the dialogue is approximated from memory. Um, and, but I think, I think it's great to have scenes in your pieces. Okay, mm -hmm. very good. Um, you mentioned submitting to sites that don't pay, but are well respected. Would you be willing to suggest a couple for an emerging writer to pursue? Um, the Rumpus pays a very little bit, um, and it's a very prestigious uh, clip to have written for the Rumpus. And sometimes they have these um, opportunities to submit shorter pieces. I would go on their site and and you know tool around and look for um, places where you can sign up for emails and stuff like that. Um, uh, other places that don't pay. Uh, oh boy. And well, you know what I work. might suggest as well, in terms of building up clips, college literary magazines are a wonderful place to start. They are yes. always looking for new work. They don't pay, but they're often staffed with very talented MFA students and faculty and an editorial yes. board. So I think that's an excellent place. And there are so many now. Sari, did you want to say more about that? Yeah, no, th that's a great thing. Um, I'm also thinking about Hippocampus. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, ca I can't, I can't off the top of my head think of any, but um, Google, uh, you know, and also get on literary Twitter, you know, get on, get on Twitter, uh, follow, you know, search for literary journals, follow them, and then, then you'll get, um, you know, calls for submissions. Mm -hmm. The other thing that you can do is go to uh, Poets and Writers, the website of Poets and Writers. And um, if you're a member of Poets and Writers, you can search their database and they have an extensive database of literary journals and every yeah. information about them too, like what they're looking for, whether they pay, how often they accept submissions, and there's just a wealth of information there. So there's really no dearth of places to send your work to. Definitely. Yep. We and have about one more minute. Okay, um, I have two more questions, um, if that's possible. Yep. And we have one person asking, what is the funding source for long reads? We are owned by WordPress. Okay. Um, and its parent company, Automatic. Okay, mm -hmm. great. And also, well, but also we are reader supported. People become members for $50 a year. Um, they get a tote bag and they get, um, the newsletters, uh, you can also just get the newsletters for free. You go to longreads.com forward slash newsletter, uh, newsletters. Um, and then, um, yeah, so that, that's our funding. And what was the other question? Last question is, what are you reading for pleasure lately? <laughs> ah, well, I just um, asked my bookstore to get 
Carmen Maria Machado's memoir. Ah, uh, in the dream house. house. In the dream house. Yeah. Um, I um, just got uh, Linda Barry's a uh, book on making cartoons um, because I am starting to illustrate my newsletter, Adventures in Journalism. Um, I also enjoy fiction lately. Um, I just finished a galley for Emily Gould's new novel, Perfect Tunes. I'm reading Marcy Germansky's Very Nice. Mm. Um, it's been kind of fun to escape into fiction a little bit. Okay. Thank you, Sari. I do both as well. I wanted to say just another word about long reads. I've been a longtime supporter, and I just I feel it's so important to step up and support the the good writing that's happening on the web. It it's never enough, but even just that little yearly contribution, and you get so much. And um, you do, as Sarah mentioned, you get that tote bag and uh, <laughs> I carry my books everywhere and it's got the L on it. And so people think I had this made and that's this uh -huh. is my... <laughs> say, oh, is that Liana? It's like, no, it's long reads, but, <laughs> you know, so uh, Sari, for people who want to follow you on Twitter and or subscribe to your wonderful newsletter, I recommend both. Um, yeah, I'm Sari Botton, one word on Twitter, uh, S-A-R-I-B-O-T-T-O-N. And my newsletter is adventuresinjournalism.substack.com. Fantastic. Thank you. We just are going to take another moment to talk about the MFA. But before we do that, I want to thank you very much again, Sari. It's a pleasure. Um, I love talking with you. I know we have many more conversations in our future, but this was a great one and um, I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed chatting with you. Wonderful. So for those of you who are not familiar with the MFA, if any of you have more questions about what we do and how we do it, uh, please visit us at graduate at baypath.edu and you can do a little search and you'll find us. We're right there. I'm the director of the program. We're in our sixth year now. It's exclusively creative nonfiction. So for people who are working on a collection of personal essays or working in the memoir form, and also for some reported pieces, we have people who write profiles in our MFA or who do more reportage. And we're interested in emerging voices and the program is a no residency, meaning it's online only. And we, we really work hard to create a strong community in our classes. And I, I feel very good about that. And also about our field seminar in Ireland, which happens every summer. We gather together on the west coast of Dingle for a week of writing and sharing and invite guest writers. And, that's an optional elective, but we offer it every year in addition to all kinds of writing seminars and Writer's Day panels. So visit us if you have more questions. I'd be happy to answer any of them. And thank you so much, Jen and Sari, again. And thank you. Thank it was you. my pleasure. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. We have a number of folks um, on the line uh, saying thank you through the um, chat box. So I just wanted to convey that as well. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, bye-bye, everyone. Okay, bye-bye.